Congratulations. My name is Deborah Hand. I'm with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I'm the MCAS Alt Coordinator. And I'm here with Laura Hines, who is our MCAS All Education Consultant and has worked closely with the department for many years. I'm also here with Kevin Froten and our three other, two other um, teacher consultants that are going to be behind the curtain to help us out. You should be here if you want to know more about students using access skills or very, very low entry points. So in just a moment, I'm going to turn this over to Laura Hines, and I'm going to go behind the curtain, and I'll see you at the end of the presentation. So I'll turn it over to you, Laura. Thanks, Deb. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and I'm here to say to talk to you about access skills and low entry points, um, as Deb mentioned. But I also want to just um, say parenthetically, if the last few weeks of PowerPoint trainings have left you with more questions than answers because your students are really not able to address most of the curriculum content that um, we've been discussing, this presentation might be for you. So what are access skills? Um, have you seen this graphic to see how the resource guide is organized? And it shows those little bean men climbing up building block steps to reach the heights of the grade level standards. And I like it, though, because it actually acknowledges that some students lack the earliest motor or communication skills, and they actually need that ramp to even make it to the very lowest step. So I want to take a hot minute and talk about what access skills are and what they are not, because I want you to really take a look at that bottom step, that red step, and let's explore some of the entry points that are found right there. So this is how the resource guide is organized. And it begins with grade level standards as written, and it breaks those standards down into entry points that have been, that have been vetted by the content area experts into increasingly less complex skills so that children of all different ability levels can enter the curriculum at a level that's challenging but appropriate for them. So before we talk about access skills, we really have to talk about what access skills are not because some teachers recognizing their kids have such significant challenges, they're inclined to go directly to the lowest available um, point and select one for their students and they start with the access skills. And I mentioned this because back when we had these training sessions in person, um, people often would be sharing their frustrations about teaching academic content to students with significant medical challenges. You know, my students that are, um, also deaf and blind, they sleep most of the day because they're heavily medicated to prevent seizures, and would be sitting around, you know, beginning to brainstorm, and invariably another frustrated teacher would come up to our group because they had an access student too. And of course, we access teachers because perhaps out of necessity, we're great supporters to one another. And so the group would always ask the teacher approaching our table if our student, if that student had an established communication system. And the newly arrived teacher would say, yeah, my student talks. And then the teachers in, our, in the access group would say, does the student have any volitional movement? And the newly arrived teacher would say, well, yeah, the student writes, but they're in the sixth grade and they can only write letters. So if you're rolling your eyes hearing this, it may be because the students that you're teaching are working at the access skill level. Because even though we acknowledge that developing curriculum for students that are significantly below average is challenging, if your student has speech, he most likely is not an access skill student. Let me say that again. If your student has speech they, or an established communication system, most likely he is not an access student, even if he's working significantly below grade level. Um, kids at the access level, they're sometimes referred to the 1% of the 1%, and it really is a very small group. So let me share some examples of students who are not assessing access skills. So the first bullet says the 10th grade student who's reading at a first grade level is not addressing the curriculum at an access level. Really? You can look for low level entry points and many of them seem very dis distant from the expectations of a typical 10th grade student. But the resource guide has done a great job of breaking apart those standards so that 
students, even with very limited symbolic language, can enter the curriculum. And I, well, I'll show you some of those um, entry points in just a minute. But take a look at the second bullet point. And maybe this sounds like one of your kids. An eighth grade student with significant behavioral issues who refuses to write, but will only shout the answers from under the desk is still not addressing the curriculum at an access skill level. Really, I mean, even for students with behavioral challenges that interfere with participation in academic assignments, the low entry point may be the just right challenge. Hey, I'm not saying it's easy, but it may be possible. And for those kids, you have to consider reducing the academic demands, capturing the student responses on teacher documented work samples whenever the academic teaching opportunity arises, even if that kid's shouting an answer from under the desk. And the point is, these students can address academic content. So again, who's not addressing access skills? Here's a couple more. So a sixth grade student with an emerging communication system who can only answer simple questions by using eye gaze to the correct response from a field of three icons is still not addressing the curriculum at an access skill level. So let me put that another way. The response, the kid is using eye gaze, but the response format is not the skill. What makes this right or wrong is not that the students about the students eye gazing ability. I mean, based on this brief description, it appears that the data that the teacher is collecting is reflecting the student's accuracy choosing the correct answer to a question. So if you're taking data on a kid's ability to eye gaze to a particular picture to demonstrate comprehension of something that they just heard read aloud, that's an entry point, really. And you're asking the student to identify the characters in a literary text? Isn't that what the student's showing using his eye gaze? But you might have a student who is you're actually just taking data on their um, tracking to any picture from any story. And the goal is just for the, the student to simply attend. And that's an access skill. And for some students with significant college um, cognitive challenges, just getting them to track and attend is the skill. And that's an important skill. And let me give you an example. Uh, Lindsay was one of my students who was, I mean, this gal was all personality and she drew people to her like a magnet. Uh, her laugh was infectious. And although as teachers, we don't have any favorites, if I were on the screen right now, you'd see me winking because she was just all that in a bag of chips. I mean, she was something else. And folks that knew Lindsay well knew that she communicated with facial expressions and different pitched vocalizations, but she really deserved to have a formalized communication method so that she could express the many, many, many thoughts and ideas that we knew she had. And we were desperate to find a reliable switch site, and we tried all kinds of strategies to see if she could make some choices. Um, but her tone really limited her responses. In fact, she was a habitual headrest breaker, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, that's how much tone she had. So we tried to see if she could make some choices through um, eye gaze or eye pointing. And we spent an entire MCAS cycle tracking her ability to eye gaze to a target um, placed in all different positions and all different sizes on all different backgrounds with different colors and different lighting and movements and distances to see if that made any difference. And the results were variable, but I mean, that's common in our business, right? But anyway, talk, going back to Lindsay, the following year, I asked the para to set up a, um, a story and record some data uh, of Lindsay tracking um, because I knew we had to start early. Um, but the para mistakenly was using the pictures that I had set aside for another student and started to record the data on the teacher um, documented work sample, asking the questions with two pictures where she had to choose the correct answer. And when the parish showed me the data, I, I was shocked. First of all, it was she was using the, the worksheets for a wrong student, but that's another problem. But even though Lindsay's data wasn't great, after a year of just um, working on looking at a target, which was the access skill, this data showed that Lindsay was using her eye gaze to make a choice to identify the character name from a field of two. And that's an entry point. And the best part about this story to me was that the look on Lindsay's face when I asked her if she was answering the questions 
was just something else. So it, it seems clear to me um, that this line between access skills and low entries can be really difficult to ascertain, but let's look at the third grade student in this bullet that we have. The third grade student is being marked inaccurate for grasping the wrong manipulative when asked to match a shape drawn on a paper. That student is not addressing the curriculum at the access level. I mean, you take a look at this. What is the teacher testing? What makes the student right or wrong? From this brief descrip description, it appears that the answer is marked wrong because the student's selecting the shape that doesn't match. And that's an entry point. Match two shapes made from different materials. Now there is a geometry access point about grasping um, that you just grasp geometric shapes. But what makes this particular student right or wrong? If the answer is marked wrong because the student didn't grasp any geometric shape within the expected latency period, that would have been an access skill. Okay, so let me just summarize it again. Who was not addressing access skills? If you're taking the data on the accuracy of the icon of the shape chosen that's academic content, a measurable outcome based on a low level entry point is probably appropriate. And what am I talking about? Remember that, that little bean man and that little green step? Well, that little green step were the examples of low entry points. For example, there's one on matching words or pictures to objects or icons. Whatever um, format they're using, if they're matching the words or pictures, that's a low level entry point on page 140. If they can identify whatever system that they're using, the main character of literary text, that's an entry point. If they're answering yes or no questions related to numbers, quantity, or counting, that's also an entry point. And sometimes it feels like a gigantic stretch to consider that a 10th grade student who's a virtual non-reader can be addressing an entry point, but that's the exact underpinning of this all process. Students can address grade level standards, but at entry points that are appropriate for their level. And you don't have to get too hung up on identifying exactly which grade level standard the entry point that you've chosen aligns. As long as you're choosing an entry point within that required strand or domain, it's acceptable. These entry points have been vetted by the content area experts. So entry points provide students working well below grade level expectations with opportunities to enter into the curriculum but sometimes at very, very early starting points. Now, if you're struggling to find an appropriate entry point and your student does have language, you might wanna contact Deb at the department and she can help you, um, you know, navigate the resource guide perhaps. But you know, that being said, many students do need that ramp and access skills are appropriate. And so for a very small number of students, with the most complex and significant cognitive disabilities, they are at access skills. So for those of you who have students that do not have a symbolic communication system, they don't have any motor skills that allow them to currently address academic content, that they're addressing developmental milestones, the rest of this presentation will show you how you can complete an access portfolio. Are you with me? Okay, so this is the importance of access skills. So again, although a student's IEP objectives are the overriding learning focus for that student, providing him or her with the opportunity to practice those objectives in the context of the general cl classroom and receive instruction on those objectives in the context of general activity, education activities represents one fundamental way of ensuring with, that students with significant disabilities do participate in the general curriculum. So again, this, this first seems like a stretch, particularly when um, I was in the, in the classroom, my students had IEPs that addressed ADLs or motor skills or focused on increasing engagement and building social skills. That's what I was all about. And this academic stuff, it was just crazy, right? Um, so academic skills were considered outside the student's zone of proximal development. And especially in the beginning, I was so frustrated with the idea that I could have my students participate in any meaningful way in statewide assessment. So at that time, a common IEP objective I had was toothbrushing, 
which is not a standards-based activity. Okay, okay, it's not a standards-based activity, but that was this the skill that the parents and the team had determined was really going to be the appropriate thing for my kid. And I must admit that I often made very little progress with that goal. I mean, toothbrushing was practiced maybe what once a day, or maybe a little more if the OT was in the building. Um, and my student was tactically defensive, and they lacked tone, and you know, was really unmotivated to just hold objects. What, you know, what was going on? Well, I found out about something called the critical skill. And this process of, of MCAS really made me take a look at this, I, this notion of critical skill. So what's the critical skill in this? Well, I want to share that my students made more pro progress when I started focusing on this critical skill necessary to brush teeth, which is grasping. And so when I reframed this goal to consider the grasping aspect, I found ways to practice the skill across contents and across skills all day long. And I incorporated grasping into the curriculum. So I reframed the goal to say, well, given a tool, the student will grasp it for two to four seconds without dropping it in about half of the sessions observed. So take a look. When the critical skill the critical skills become the access skills, then we can do this during a standards-based activity. So I was able to start taking data on grasp, grasping materials as they were counted, grasping materials representing the key idea of the, of the, of the story. I made um, clothespin characters, you know, on clothespins, and they could grasp that to represent a key idea in the story. Or they could grasp cylindrical objects in science investigations. And my students began making more progress. So I'm uncertain as to how much academic content my students learned in those areas. But, you know, taking data on this grasping across content areas made learning more fun. It was more age appropriate. And sometimes I discovered unintended positive outcomes from having these higher expectations. And I also saw improvements in the critical skill of grasping, which translated across non-academic contexts. It was a win-win. So grasping and other developed milestones are the access skills. So take a look at this resource guide. Um, so in the resource guide and in the forms and graphs program, you'll find a robust list of access skills that are used to create measurable outcomes. So you can look at this resource guide excerpt. And you can notice that all of the access skills are developmental milestones but they're also built in there, they're, they're practiced in the context of a specific academic content. Now, again, there's no expectation that the student's gonna be tested on ratios. And the expectation is that in all of the occasions where you're collecting the data on the skill, it will, you know, for the purposes of the assessment, they will happen in an activity related to, for example, the next one I'm gonna show you is on ratios. So like the first one says, locate objects partially hidden or out of sight to expose a ratio. Use one object to act on another to um, use to demonstrate ratios. Or the last, the third bullet is turn on or off technology used to demonstrate ratios in proportional relationships. So after carefully considering which access skill you, you, um, you select and which perhaps aligns with other IEP goals you might have for your kiddo, you're going to create this measurable outcome. So let's get started. Let's look and talk about what I'm talking about, this measurable outcome. So uh, first, even to get to the strand, you know, of course, that you're going to, um, you, the skill survey must be completed. And again, um, if you don't remember that as you're looking at those skill surveys and before you get too frustrated, uh, remember that there's a little button uh, on the bottom after the whole list of skills that might say, my student is unable to perform any of these skills. So you can click that button to help um, work on your skill surveys. But again, don't go there directly. Go through the whole list because you might find that there might be some of those low level entry points that you weren't considering. But if your student is it, unable to do any of those skills, um, you can use that button on your skill survey. But after looking at the range of skills, if your student's unable to perform any of them, you know, you're going to click the bottom um, button at the bottom of the list. And then when you've identified the access skill, you create the measurable outcome. So when creating a measurable outcome from an access skill, it's important that you specify accuracy criteria to ensure reliable data collection. So 
compiling you this an MCAS um, uh, assessment, it's optimally a group effort. And hopefully you can rely on your paras or your specialists to assist with data collection. But across the board, everyone needs to be collecting data using the same frame. Because in the absence of shared criteria that indicates the students successfully completing the task, the data collection is unreliable. So you can see in this measurable outcome, we say that the students turning on technology to demonstrate a proportional relationship by pressing an access switch, switch and then the criteria is latency put right in there within 15 seconds of the direction. And then you just add mastery for the task, task 80% accuracy and 100% independence. That's just included so you'll know when you're going to stop focusing on this measurable outcome as written, or you might want to change the latency criteria. So that's how you're writing this measurable outcome. So it's the uh, skill plus the criteria. So what was I talking about? Why you need to have this um, criteria across settings? Uh, I had a student who was going to activate a switch to conduct a survey. That was um, part of the measurable outcome. And when I was working with the student, I mean, the data was all over the place. And But with the para, the data was awesome. And so I thought it was a good idea for me to shadow them and see uh, what switch site they were using that was so reliable. And so, um, you know, he, um, the student's on a scooter board and they knock on the first office door and the pair announced that John was there to ask the polling question. And the pair is chatting with the secretary for a few minutes until um, John, who was on the scooter board, caught. <coughs> and predict predictably, when he did so, his head switch was activated and the pair turned to me with a look that said, see, 100% accurate and 100% independent. And that's when I realized that we needed some consistent accuracy criteria. Do you know what I mean? So, all right, so now we've got our measurable outcome and that um, once the skill survey is conducted and the measurable outcome has been determined, you know, putting together an access strand portfolio is not unlike putting together a strand that addresses entry points. So we're gonna need a strand cover sheet, a skill survey, data, and um, two pieces of evidence with a work descriptor label. Um, oh, and then of course there's, um, the same unique requirements for science and writing for an access portfolio. So if you're unclear about how to um, create the writing samples uh, for your access students, we did a separate um, writing access presentation. So you might wanna look for that if you have questions about how to put together specifically a writing access strand. All right, so the set of evidence is gonna be the same. And so you're gonna need a data chart. So one thing that's a little bit different is how to write clear descriptions on your data chart. Um, and this is just a quick thought I have on data charts. I mean, there are advantages for each type of data chart and it's totally uh, personal preference which one you choose because you need to have just one for your language, reading and math portfolio strands. But you know, consider which one works best for your needs. So uh, in, in my school, uh, a line graphs kind of popular because they don't use much printer ink, but the bar graph is really clear to show parents. And the field data chart is a great one to use to track student response during tabletop or discrete trials. But remember, you're only gonna pick one data chart per strand. Um, but one thing that you really wanna put a little bit more attention to when you're compiling a strand that addresses an access skill is writing clear brief descriptions. So take a look at this slide. Um, the measurable outcome is to choose an array of choose from an array of two errorless choices within 15 seconds of a directive related to vocabulary acquisition. So the 15 seconds of a directive is the um, accuracy criteria, and then the mastery criteria is within 75% accuracy or 100% independence. So the important takeaway on this slide is the brief description. Now everyone knows that the brief description must include the what you know, what the skill is and the how, what the activity is. But when you're crafting a brief description for an access skill, it's also important to include not only what, the developmental skill you've identified, like, you know, uh, switch activation, grasping or releasing, or using one object or another. So not only do you need the what, and you also need the how, like what the activity is, is was it a worksheet or a game or a tabletop activity? 
but you also have to include some indication of how this activity links to the standard. And many of the access points have this um, standard or topic embedded right into the measurable outcome, but you have to make sure that that's clear in your brief description as well. So this measurable outcome specifies that the errorless choice is related to vocabulary. So let's review the examples. In the examples, if the teacher wrote the student made an errorless choice on a worksheet without including the information that it was a synonym go fish or a synonym worksheet or a synonym Je Jeopardy game or a synonym poster, it wouldn't have been clear how it matched the, the measurable outcome of being related to vocabulary. So to be really, really, really clear, when you're writing your access skill brief descriptions, you wanna be sure that you're including the skill, this activity and how it relates to the standard. So um, when I was showing this slide to some friends, they were saying to me like, well, you know, uh, what's errorless choice? Like, this, this seems to be a lot of confusion on how you can take data on something that's errorless and, and that's um, why it's used and how is it scored. So I just wanna take a quick hot minute to see how many of you are staying, um, hanging in here with me. And I wanna know how familiar you are with the term of errorless choices. Yes, no, or maybe I could use a refresher. So I'll put some uh, Jeopardy music on and you can just please answer this poll question for me. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. And while we're waiting, I'm just gonna remind people that um, science has that nice little lovely box on the bottom that says, my student can't do all this, but the other ones you're just gonna do all of column A, all the way down. But we have that nice little box that says, my student can't do anything in science only. Thanks, Deb. All right, so it looks like, can you see that, Laura? No. Okay. Oh, here we go, I can see it. So it looks like this group um, has been using errorless choices, 87% does. Um, 58% have been using errorless choices, so you know what I'm talking about. 9% has not used this. And 33% said mm, maybe they can use a little refresher. So let's just talk about errorless um, choice for just one minute. So teachers may be um, making errorless choices within a specified amount of time just to encourage students to respond and to engage in the lessons. So either choice might be correct. So the answer the students select is not what makes it right or wrong. In an errorless choice, the answer is scored incorrect um, if the student does not make a choice and typically within a specified amount of time. And so that's how you can tell if it's right or wrong. Do they meet that latency criteria? And this may be an appropriate entry point for students with emerging communication systems. Their choice may not be, their choice making may not be reliable indicators of the student's actual preferences, but the teachers can imply intentionality as a means of shaping cause and effect behavior and in building expressive communication. And the other thing too that's good about um, errorless choice making and taking data on that is the teachers can use the data they collect to look for things that motivate or engage the students. They can discover patterns in the students' responses. Are they always making a, a left or right-sided preference? Do they tend to go for something because of the color or the size or the textural preferences? You're gonna start to perhaps find even your most reliable switch sites. So while this data is not a requirement for you to include as part of the portfolio, if you're gonna to go to all the bother of creating a teacher documented workshop, you might wanna include comments that um, to record other useful information that you can use on their errorless choice that you can then use to drive your instruction. So for example, when we were doing the writing presentation, I talked about a narrative text type that um, was about facts and suggested that the teacher could create a fill in the blank template templates to just see what resonated with students after a lesson. Um, and in terms of um, double dipping, this writing sample we were gonna say could also be used for um, a science sample. And we'll talk more about double dipping in a minute, but. Um, so in a landfill exercise and garbage unit, a fill in the blank writing question might be, um, I like crushing the blank blank Oreo, or I like crushing the styrofoam cup. You know, either answer would be correct to fill in the blank, 
And um, a student who's not able to fill in the blank with about which objects in the mini landfill um, uh, changes over time, that would not be an errorless choice. So if the if the students making a different choice in the in the the way that you've set the activity up, that's not errorless. Remember that could be a low level entry point. But if either choice the student makes could be correct, the Oreos or the styrofoam cup, that could be. Um, a sample that you could collect. So again, what makes the students answer right or wrong? In a tabletop activity where the measurable outcome is making an errorless choice in an addition activity, showing how um, sets can be put together and asking if the student wants to use bears or blocks, that would be an errorless choice. But for the purposes of MCAS Alt, errorless choices are marked incorrect if the student doesn't not if the if the student chooses neither bears nor blocks within a specified amount of time or did not respond at all. And in a tabletop activity showing how sets can be put together and the teacher puts down three plus two bears and asks how many and the student has to choose whether or not it's five or seven, that is not an errorless question. A student who's making that choice is working at a low entry. So if you're unclear, you want to consider what makes the skill right or wrong on the data that you're collecting? So again, if the student, if the expectation is, if the expectation is that the student's able to make an, a response based on the accuracy of the subject area content, you're going to look for a low level entry point. If the expectation that you're is that you're focusing on collecting information on factors that promote engagement and participation for students with unreliable communication systems that's access. So again, what makes the student's response right or wrong? All right, so we've got some ideas of what we're gonna do. How are you gonna collect this evidence? So there's something that's called a teacher documented work sample. It used to be called a teacher scribed work sample, but that was just causing um, unnecessary confusion. A teacher documented um, sample is for students who don't produce a lot of work samples. So um, just like um, other pieces of evidence that you submit, it should be have the be labeled with the student's name, date, and the overall accuracy and independent. But it can, can document a series of um, trials conducted during the same activity. But it's going to specifically describe the materials and the context of the activity. Um, so when you're doing a teacher-documented work sample, it should be really clear from somebody who's looking at this that they know exactly what the expectation was on the student, what the student's response was, and how the accuracy and the independence was determined. So you should be able to look at this and know exactly you know, what was going on. So let's take a look at one um, sample. So sometimes this, um, a teacher documented work sample can look like this. It looks almost like a extended field data chart, a one day field data chart, because it's got you know, trials, and then um, it's got like the pluses and the minus, the pluses and the P's or the I's on the last column. So on one hand, it might look like an expanded field data chart, but it includes a lot more um, information. So for example, in this one, it's got the measurable outcome so that within 15 seconds of the instruction, the student's gonna give materials mm. that are gonna be counted. So that's the expectation. And so the, then the description of it says, when the teacher gives objects up to five, one at a time, pulling them off a Velcro board, while the teacher counts aloud and the, and the teacher says, give me one. So we're gonna see that there's a little, um, this first column says, after the trial, when shown pictures of workers stop the, ch the students choosing um, that they wanna keep working or stop working. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a future slide, but just put that in your, put that in your pocket for just a minute. We'll come back to that in a bit. but. So here's the detailed description of each child trial. So they took the blocks off the Velcro board and that um, and the teacher said, give me one. And he did it and it was independent. And then they said, give me two. And then it tells whether or not the kid did it or they did not. OK, so you can see. From looking at this, we can determine what the student was um, was able to give the first block because the plus and the um, independent scores were given independently within 15 seconds. Now the teacher could have also included that latency column in this sample so she could have tracked how long it did take the student to respond. And again, I'm suggesting to you, if you're gonna to go to all the bother of creating these teacher documented work samples, 
consider setting it up so that you capture all the information that could be val valuable to you to inform your teaching. So you might want to adjust that latency time. You might want to give the kid a little bit of extra time if you find out that, you know, that's necessary. You might find that the students at a point now, they're going to be able to speed it up. Okay, hold on. This goes on to the next slide. So here we can see, here's the rest of this. So you can look at the sample and then you can see exactly how um, the accuracy in the independence was calculated. So 10 out of 10, the kid did it independently. That's 100% and the, uh, accurate. And then you can see the 10 out of 10, the kid did it independently. And that was 100%. So um, again, if the teacher was using this um, piece of evidence as one of the data points, the data chart might have a brief description that might say something like, um, the student gave the blocks to the teacher, that's the skill, one at a time as the, uh, the teacher counted, so that links it to the standard, and then how do they do it? During a tabletop activity uh, with Velcro, Velcro blocks, okay? So that this activity could be on the data chart, and you could say how they use the skill, the standard, and the activity. All right, let's take a look at another one. Here's another sample. So can you see exactly what the student did here? Okay, so let's read a little bit of this slide. Um, so the brief description says, during a math work session, the student turned on technology by pressing an access switch to turn the page of a teacher-made book on the computer within 15 seconds of the directive. And the book taught about ratios and proportional relationships by showing her a series of farm animals using the phrase for every to talk about how many of each appendage, appendage each animal had. So for example, for every cow, there are four legs. So hits the trial, here's the page number. So you can see they did page one twice, they did page two, then they did page three a bunch of times, page four, page five, page six. So they said, did they turn on the technology by pressing her switch to activate the reading? Here's the latency, what was on the page? So the first time he did not do it, but he did not do it independently. So they stayed on that page again, and the kid did it within four seconds. So he was accurate and he was independent. Then on the third page, he was accurate at 14 seconds for every sheep, there are two ears, so, and so on and so forth. So you can see how the overall accuracy and the independence was collected. So does that seem crystal clear to you? Can you see exactly what the student was asked to do and how the student responded in each trial? Take a look at the second thing that went along with it. This is supporting documentation for the teacher um, uh, teacher documented worksheet. And again, um, they this teacher used this for ratios and proportions. But again, because it's reading a teacher made story, it could be used for what other strand? That's right. She could have also used it for her reading informational text. But because it's reading informational text, she'd need to, and it was a teacher made um, sample, she'd need to include a copy of a uh, page of the text. And here it is. This is a copy of the um, screenshot. So um, around the farm, for every sheep, there are two ears, for every duck, there is one beak, for every horse, da 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 da. da. So um, this was submitted along with that teacher documented work sample, and it's marked as supporting documentation so that the reviewer can have even a clearer idea of the materials and the context of the lesson. Now, if the teacher had included the student's latency and accuracy and independence on each one of these thumbnails, this sample alone could have also been an appropriate teacher documented work sample. And as I mentioned, you can also see how this could have also been used for reading informational text. You know, and especially for our students who don't produce a lot of work, it's perfectly appropriate to double dip. So when teaching across the curriculum and to use the data into, or again, maybe more strands. But you wanna make sure if this sample's used in the two different graphs, that in the brief descriptions, you wanna be clear how this, addre how this uh, uh, addresses the skill, the different standards and the activity. So the brief description might in math might say, the student turned on technology to turn the page of a ratios and proportions story on the computer. But if this sample was used in the reading and also used in the reading informational strand, the brief description might say, the student turned on technology to turn the page of a teacher made story on the computer about ratios. And again, because it's a teacher made text, the supporting documentation page showing the story must be included in the reading strand. Okay, is that clear? Ready for one more? How about this one? Um, 
So can you tell what the skill is? So let's look. So the measurable outcome is that um, the student will activate a pre-recorded voice output device within 30 seconds of the reader stopping to request more during a literacy activity related to informational text. All right. So uh, that was the measurable outcome. And let's read the brief description. Uh, during a literacy activity, reading the informational text, the polar region, the student was presented with a pre-recorded switch with the message, more please and was encouraged to activate the switch to indicate that she wanted the reader to continue. She was measured on whether she activated her switch within 30 seconds of the reading stopping. So these pictures represent the opportunities that were given to request more. Uh, these are the pages the reader stopped on, giving the student a chance to request more. And she was measured whether or not she activated a voice output device within 30 seconds of the reader stopping. So, Let's take a look. Hmm, is this what you expected to see? So the thumbnail pictures of each page documenting the accuracy and independence of each trial, um, you know, see the measurable um, outcome and work description label that we just read. So you can see there's the first picture, there's the book cover, and then here's the picture of this right there. Uh, 35 seconds, so that didn't meet the, the criteria, so she was not correct, but she was independent. And then the second page, 20 seconds, accurate and independence. Okay, so you can see how this was done. So collecting the student's work samples can show you some valuable information. So does the student respond to certain illustrations? Does the student have a left-sided preference or a right-sided preference? Does the student start strong and fatigue or does it take some time to warm up to the activity? All of this information is intended for you to review and make good decisions on improving student performance. Now, if you've heard me before, you've talked before, you may have heard um, the story of Caroline. And so she was one of my students and she had a measurable outcome about temporal words and her measurable outcome was, um, I can't remember exactly, but it was something on um, uh, showing what comes next. And she was making some progress, but as with many of our students, um, she was, you know, sometimes pretty inconsistent. So I had this para named Susie. And um, when she was putting in some of the data, I mean, she was so amazing. I mean, can you imagine having your para putting some of your data in, um, inputting your data for you, but she was just unbelievable. But anyway, um, Susie was doing this and she was um, commenting that, you know, the data was inconsistent. So, you know, I, I was, I just shrugged it off and, you know, say, come on, Susie, let's, you know, let's go. You know, we, we you know, we, we got a lot of these things to do. We got a lot of these portfolios to put together, you know, let's go. But um, Susie said, you know, all of these um, low data points were on Tuesdays. You know, I told you Susie was awesome. But anyway, she said, I'm going to look at the teacher um, documented work samples and see what was going on in those days. So she pulled them all out. And sure enough, on Tuesday, Caroline never wanted what comes next. She was using the, ske the schedule board as a choice board. So she wasn't choosing what comes next. She was choosing what she wanted. And on Tuesdays, she never wanted what comes next. And so we brought this to the SLP and she made some modifications that made the schedule board different than the choice board. And voila, Caroline with enough reinforces started telling what comes next, even on Tuesdays. And I mentioned this not just to give a shout out to the fabulous Susie, but also to encourage you, if you're gonna go to the bother of creating these teacher documented work samples, you wanna make sure they're giving you good information and I'm encouraging you to review your teacher documented work samples to look for preferences and trends that might inform your teaching. If you're gonna do this, do this in a way that's gonna be authentic and helpful to you. Okay, so here's just one more. Here's an, and so somebody said, well, show me how to make a teacher documented work sample. And well, there's lots of different kinds depending on lots of different teaching. And these are just some uh, examples to just you know, generate some thoughts for you. And, and hopefully, um, you know, you'll come up with some great ones and you'll start sharing these with your colleagues. That's one of the best things too about the portfolios and progress sessions that when we are sitting at that table together, the group of us 
um, folks that we can share our ideas with each other. And that's one of the things I miss the most about, you know, not working with you in person. But anyway, take a look at this one. Uh, this is an, a teacher documented sample using a series of photographs. And uh, I have to admit that generally I'm a little shy about using photographs. They typically just show the ta-da moments of like one single picture of the kids standing in the garden and it says, you know, 100% accurate and 80% independent, which can't be scored because you can't have, you can't verify an 80% score of independence on a single picture. So the educator's manual on page 21 contains additional considerations for using photos as evidence. And it might be something if you're gonna use photographs that you might want to um, consider. Um, but take a look at this series because I do think that this is a series of photographs that, that really works because um, of the great way that the um, teacher um, wrote the brief descriptions and made the notations on it. So for example, um, they're showing you that in the first four pictures of the first trial, so the student's presented with a quarter moon. On the, so his measurable outcome is that he's going to locate objects partially hidden out of sight in an earth, moon, stars, solar system, or a season's activity. Uh, again, the mastery criteria is with 80% accuracy and 80% independence. So the first one, he's, it's just showing like the setup. He's presented with a quarter moon, and then his teacher tells him to find the moon, and he's required a prompt to reach towards the felt board. And with a prompt from his teacher, he grasps the black overlay and he reviews that it was partially hidden. And he removes the black overlay and he um, has a prompt from the teacher. So you can see from that trial that he was accurate, but that he needed a prompt. And then it goes on to show what happens in the second trial. And so that you can see that the second trial, he does it accurately and he does it independently because it's that whole series of pictures so that you can verify the accuracy and the independence based on those photos. So that's another way that you can um, create a teacher documented work sample. So I hope those examples have given you some, some things to think about, but I told you that we'd talk about self-evaluation. So, um, you know, often the teachers that I'm working with at Access say, my student cannot self-evaluate. And I, it's one that I kind of disagree with because I think that, um, choice making is what we do all day. And choice making is important because choice making and evaluation of your work are essential components of self determination. And this notion of self determination, it's an important predictor of um, successful post school outcomes. And it's also um, something that's really um, empowering and really gives kids an opportunity to practice their expressive communications and say, you know, have some control over some of the things in their in their life. So take a look at this. Um, think about these uh, building these choice making activities. Um, so you can have a choice of materials, response format, order of events, partner, continuing or terminating the activity. You want to see the student's voice. You want it to be authentic. So if you're documenting the student's expressive communication responses on the work descriptor label. You can just make a note of what it was. And again, remember that self-evaluation just isn't about choosing a reinforcer. It's really about choice making and having an opportunity to direct some part of the lesson. And, you know, this is about building expressive communication and self-determination. And I'm frequently asked about what do you do if the kid doesn't make a choice? And my answer is, it is what it is. And I think that um, given that scenario, we've, we've just got to keep trying and we want to keep it authentic. You know, personally, I think that, you know, putting a bingo dauber in, you know, my students' hands and just stomping it on a smiley face, that that might count as a self-evaluation. Self but for me, that's not authentic. And that doesn't really have much meaning for my kiddo. So that's not the, the type of um, self-evaluation that I, I tend to choose to, to, to pick. So if you want more information on self-evaluation, it's in the educator's manual on page 26. And I just want to close with this last, uh, this sample of the self-evaluation we saw on one of the earlier work samples where the kid was um, turning on technology on the switch and they were taking the blocks off the Velcro board and the little self-evaluation that's in the red 
uh, box says, after the trial, when shown pictures of work and stop, the student chose to work, stop, or in that sample, they weren't asked. Or this one, if the kid wanted to work, stop, or not ask, and the kid picked work, and he was keep going. So do you remember that? So so this teacher um, documented work sample that included the section on self-evaluation where the um, the teacher built into a lesson a way for the student to um, indicate that they wanted to continue or terminate the activity. So I was sharing this with um, somebody because I really think that being able to direct the termination of activity is really a powerful thing to be able to give to students. And I know I said that at one of the training and one of the teachers who, you know, she wasn't, I don't think that typically she was buying so much what I was putting down, but she said to me, oh, great. You know, so when my frustrated student upends the table, you just want me to write that in the self-evaluation section on the work descriptor label. You know, and I, I looked at her and, and I thought to myself, well, you know, I suppose that you, you know, you, you can just write that in there and you're right. That would count as a, um, an example of self-evaluation. But I think if, if, if you, if you, if that's a, you know, common occurrence, you might want to consider how powerful it could be if when you saw those eyebrows like darting down and you could just, you know, he was about to blow and you could start to teach him that using his Mayor Johnson pictures or an adapted sign and that he could communicate that he was ready to terminate the activity before the table goes over. I mean, that would really be a powerful thing. So yeah, you know, that would, that sounds like this is a kid you really want to build that in as part of his self-evaluation. So building me meaningful self-evaluation into daily instruction has shown me some really positive, unexpected, powerful outcomes. And it's something that, you know, I hope that you can fold into some of your, your lessons too and use this MCAS all process as a way that you can um, enhance and, um, you know, make your, your lessons even more um, meaningful and exciting for you. Okay, so I think this is a good place for me to terminate this presentation. And I see that there's a handful of questions, so. In terms of the STE access skill, does it make sense to, is it make sense to select activities based on the core ideas and practices rather than adapting and modifying the material from the high quality units? I, um, think, I think it's both. You wanna talk about yeah. that here? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I, yeah, I, when you're using the high quality material, you're just adapting it to at the level that your student needs. So I think it's important to do both. You agree, Laura, you want to add anything? By the very nature of you using the high quality units, you're going to be hitting those core ideas. And then it's up to you to go to the access skills section and find access skills within that core idea. But I think that it's it's all the same and it's all going to be all good. So can a student place Velcro picture on a page of a story for access skill within the literature strand? Can you offer the correct picture as the only choice and measure whether or not they place it on the page presented? That's exactly the difference. If you're having them put uh, a picture on a board and you want them to choose whether or not that they should use the picture of Peter Pan or Wendy, um, and you want them to match the correct picture to the right character, right. you might be an entry. But if you just want them, if if the the skill is at um, you know matching, um, making an errorless mm -hmm. choice, that's going to be access. And you're just measuring how you know get some latency of how long it's going to take them to um, match it, or whether or not that they're going to orient the picture the correct way. You know, have to decide what your accuracy criteria is going to be for your access skill. So thank you so much. Thank you. And again, we'll stay online for a little bit, let you um, think of any questions you might have, but we certainly appreciate your time and um, we'll see you in January.